Okay, so how, how does this line up? So this is an NNT of 1. Uh, I don't think you'd be able to get the study funded. It would be exiting an airplane with versus without a parachute, something like that, where you've got a 0% placebo response rate and a 100% uh, intervention rate. I think very occasionally you might see this sometimes in prevention of schizophrenia, but you don't see it in bipolar, okay, in NNT of 2. That's very robust, okay. For bipolar approved treatments, the NNTs and the approved agents range between 3 and 9, okay. Once in a while you hit, hit a 10. This is not really relevant in bipolar. That kind of NNT can be relevant. Um, resuscitating infants at birth with oxygen versus room air, preventing mortality. NNT is 20. It's worth doing. <laughs> what kind of outcome? It depends on the severity of the outcome. Okay. These kind of these are a little embarrassing, but you will find this in the outpatient management of bronchitis. That kind of thing. So our our excess benefit over placebo is ranging, by and large, between about 10 and 30 percent. Okay, and so the, the, the things that we think that are really potent, they're beating placebo by about 30 percent. The guys who are just squeaking in are beating placebo by about 10 percent. So most of the time, so we're not going to be thinking about this stuff, okay, it's not clinically relevant. Um, most of the time, Things that are in this kind of gray zone, well, why do it if you got something that works better? But think about bipolar depression. There's only two approved treatments that are as likely to do harm as good. You're going to run out of treatments pretty fast. You're going to start looking around for something else. And if you have something that isn't, doesn't quite make the grade on uh, efficacy, if it's a star on tolerability, and the person isn't like horribly acutely ill, maybe this is something to consider, okay? All right, so looking at harms, everything that's FDA approved for bipolar disorder has a boxed warning. It is not the boxed warnings, however, that lead us to discontinue drugs the most often. It may lead us to just not even try, okay? But if something was the most common reason for discontinuing and was a box warning, then it probably wouldn't get FDA approved. The closest thing to that could be neurotoxicity with lithium. That could be. That's, that's one of the older warnings. So there's, there's plenty of scary warnings there. Um, we need to pay attention to that. That usually occurs at a phase prior to administering the drug. So I don't think I've ever given lamotrigine to somebody with a history of C Stevens Johnson syndrome. Okay, it's you know I got a flu shot, and you know have you ever had Guillain-Barré sy syndrome? You know, it's just common sense that if you if you've got something that's a really horrible side effect, and somebody's got a history of stuff like that, well maybe you don't want to be doing that. Okay. Similarly, all of the antipsychotics have a boxed warning. And actually, all the antidepressants do, too. Okay? So I guess the benzos are not FDA-approved for bipolar disorder, but they don't have a boxed warning. And some of the more interesting boxed warnings from the perspective of bipolar disorder include these ones. So who gets singled out for that? Anything that has shown any ability to work in bipolar or unipolar depression. Okay? So guilt by association for aripiprazole, even though it's not approved for bipolar depression because of its add-on indication in unipolar. Okay, olanzapine, fluoxetine combination, and quetiapine, three of them. And importantly, this is only in, pe in uh, pediatric and young adult populations. Okay, so I, had a, I was attending last summer like some 75-year-old guy comes in suicidal because he went off his antidepressants because he, he heard that caused su suicidality. These box warnings don't usually have an age factor, okay? 
But this is the increased risk of suicidality is in, exclusively in this younger population. If you're 25 to 65, it's no different. And if you're over 65, there's actually a decrease in new onset suicidality. So that guy who went off the antidepressant was exactly the wrong person. So was that Bob added on evidence or inference? Inference. Class warning. Okay. But do they exclude clozapine? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, anything, the only at atypicals with that box are uh, drugs that have traction in depressive symptoms. And clozapine, there's a lack of evidence. Okay, so if we're looking at these harms, for some, the, you know, our, one of our main problems is with the second generation antipsychotics is uh, some of them are as likely to cause harm as benefit. Okay. And... Really, if, if you're in that situation, you ought to know it, and you, you, ought to be in a, you ought to really, really need benefit if you're going to take on that harm liability. And if there's some way to sidestep it, maybe you ought to. So if you look at, if you look at these agents in terms of side effects, the antipsychotics are at the top, then the mood stabilizers, and then the antidepressants, say. Okay, so we've got, we've got three groups there. and. The antidepressants, uh, they are amongst the most used agents probably because they have the fewest side effects. Okay, and the antipsychotics are used a lot probably because they have the most efficacy. Nobody rides for free. It's, it's probably the case that broadly speaking, the more efficacy you've got, the more side effects you've got. You get things that are mo more potent for the good or bad. And so this is just an example of one. Imagine you have a 40% sedation rate. Now, where would you ever run into that? Quit typing. Uh, versus 20%. These are people who are just sleepy because they're depressed. You get a 20% excess, so the number needed to harm is 5. So higher NNH is a better outcome. Lower NNT is a better outcome. And double digits are probably, well, they're more adequate than single digits. And so you, you want to be beating placebo for the good by at least 10%. And you don't want a disadvantage compared to placebo for the bad of more than 10%. So changed into this parlance, you want single digit NNTs and double digit NNHs. You want to be causing more good than harm. And so this leads to patients overestimating harms. So the same waiting room, there's five people sitting there, two of them are sleeping, and they say, boy, man, this guy uses a lot of sedatives, okay? What they don't appreciate is even if, even if that intervention wasn't done, either boring psychotherapy or quetiapine, uh, you would still have one person who was sleepy. So as clinicians, we tend to overestimate benefits. Our clients tend to overestimate harms. And that, that actually is probably a pretty good thing because it creates a kind of dynamic tension for a dialogue. Now, in schizophrenia, that dialogue may play out differently than in mood disorders. OK, so what we're doing is balancing efficacy and uh, risk. OK, so what we want, more benefit and risk, we want the NNT to be lower than the NNH. And we want it to be a lot lower. OK, so broadly speaking, let's, let's go for single digit NNTs and double digit NNHs. OK? That's not what we got. We don't got that. OK? So this is a slide from hell. And this is acute mania, monotherapy adjunctive, acute bipolar depression, maintenance, and maintenance adjunctive. And so, Home base is ostensibly mood stabilizers, but we steal things from neurology. We steal things from schizophrenia. We find treatments wherever we can. A little bit of pattern recognition. These things in bold are all single digits. OK, there's no double digits there. OK, haloperidol, unapproved, but active comparator in some contemporary studies, performed OK. Over here, for adjunctive, pretty well the same story. We got, this is, this is the most interesting column in the whole thing. This is our main unmet need. 
Okay. And so you look at the left hand column, you think, yeah, well, we're doing pretty good here. We're actually doing terrible. Look at this. Okay. We've only got two agents that are FDA approved. The, the approved agents, the efficacy is not that bad. It's, it's comparable to other phases. Okay. But um, these are inadequate numbers needed to treat. Okay? And that's the way you have to, with number needed to treat, you have to give a confidence interval. And if there's no significant separation from placebo, it's enormously wide. Yep. You haven't put up antidepressants at all on this. Question. Well, they haven't been tried in this kind of trial. And I'll, I'll deal with them sim uh, separately. Okay? Um, the only, well, there is one antidepressant that's FDA approved. There's one, okay, fluoxetine given in combination with olanzapine. It's the only FDA approved antidepressant. So of two approved treatments, one has an antidepressant component. You can't ignore that. You can see that, look at, look what happened with olanzapine, close but no cigar, and lamotrigine. So why do people talk about lamotrigine? It's because it's so well tolerated. Olanzapine. The good, new, the good news is it's, uh, uh, it's olanzapine monotherapy is no worse than OFC. Bad news is it's no better. Okay, so you've got all this weight gain liability with sub-threshold efficacy. Okay, so the thing that gets interesting in this column is the one where it's a near miss, but it's got really good tolerability. Okay. So this is another way of depicting this. And for good or bad, this is what industry has brought to the table. Literally thousands of patients in con randomized controlled trials. And yes, this is to, to make money and get FDA approval, but it would be astonishing if we couldn't learn something from all this stuff. Right? It would be ab absolutely astonishing if we couldn't learn anything of use from this. Okay. And so what you see here, and this is kind of like pattern re recognition, you see a spread of somewhere, on average, about 20% spread. Okay, so to get into the game, you need to win by 10%. You know, it gets as good as 30% once in a while, but on average, it's about a 20% benefit. Okay, and you know, on a good day, your placebo response rate is as low as 20%. So what we're doing with specific treatment decisions is kind of doubling up whatever our nonspecific influences yield. Okay, well, that's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. Um, so some, some people, some, some clinicians say, well, I never use that. I just want to look at these things. Okay, and it's, it's fair enough, okay? You would hope that at least half the time you're getting your way, okay, regardless of what's going on with placebo. Uh, how do you get a 30% placebo response rate in acute mania? It's a three-week study. Everybody gets psychiatric hospitalization, and they all get rescue lorazepam, six milligrams for two days, four milligrams for two days, two milligrams for two days, okay? And with that pretty benign treatment, you get a 30% response rate at three weeks. So 30% uh, of the patients will get 50% better. <coughs> It's better than nothing, and it's, it's probably still a reasonably ethical thing to be doing in controlled studies, okay? But this is not an absolutely null condition. This is a, this is a fairly dramatic intervention, okay? So you add one agent to that, you pick up another 20%. This is monotherapy. You notice it's 44 versus 50. But you add a second agent, and you get you're better than a coin toss. Okay, so. What we've got is 20% benefit. You see, the, these are not, uh, the, on average, it's not eight or nine. Okay, it's not that bad. So the average situation, we're getting about 20% advantage, okay, over placebo. And this, it's not terrible. It's, it's not that bad, okay? There's only two of them, and they got too many side effects. That's the issue. Over here, the active treatment bars are lower because these are relapse rates now, okay? And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's about the same effect size. Okay, so that's, that's pretty well where we're at with this. Um, so whenever you go in, 
you get about 20% on average.